Our next speaker is Dr. Matt Cartmill from Boston University, and he will be talking about body fat and bipedality. Okay, so par parents, mind your children. Here's Vitruvian Man again. We've seen him before. Human beings are different from other animals in a lot of ways, as you've heard. And the job of scientists like today's speakers is to figure out how we got that way. The explanatory stories that uh, we paleoanthropology types tend to tell um, center on the distinctive human traits that we're proud of. Okay, unique features that seem to be connected with the standing of our species at the top of the world's food chains and dominance hierarchies. And one such trait that we all like to talk and think about, which is what this meeting is devoted to today, is bipedality, the complex of adaptations to two-footed posture and locomotion that make us upright and upstanding, that let us stand on our own two feet, and all the other metaphors of self-esteem associated with walking around on our hind legs, waving our hands in the air. Other features that we associate with human dignity and status are our nimble hands that we use to make all sorts of things, and of course our big brains, uh, and all their correlates, including the ability to talk and reason in ways that are far beyond the capacity of, of even the brightest non-human animals. But there are some other human peculiarities that we don't like to talk about so much. For example, we have uniquely smelly armpits full of scent glands. Nobody knows why. And we have really weird hair that, that grows down to our tailbones and keeps falling into our eyes. Adult males like Nietzsche here develop these, these big puffs of face fur that cover our mouths and keep getting sucked in when we eat. Both sexes have protruding bags of fatty connective tissue, something like a camel's hump, sticking out in back behind our hip joints. And adult females supplement these with another pair underlying the milk glands on the chest. And humans are about the only land-dwelling mammal of our size with no covering of fur over most of our bodies. As you can see in this photo here, even when we hide the body parts that we're proud of, our hands, our heads, uh, and our, um, our legs, we can, we can instantly identify these animals as human, can't we? Uh, by their protruding buttocks, and above all, by their sleek, hairless, slightly fatty, shiny skin. Now this peculiarity of humans has been remarked on by anatomists for decades, though it may not be quite as familiar to all of us as Wood John's animates here. And, and other terrestrial animals that have been made hairless by evolution or by selective breeding or by disease like the chimpanzee with the mange up there, these animals startle us with their wrinkled appearance. They, they lack the thick layer of subcutaneous fat that keeps human skin taut and shiny. Many of them tend to store most of their fat around their intestines and kidneys as abdominal fat, like the yellow stuff that you see here tucked into the folds and crevices of the mesenteries in the human abdomen. Okay, here are some figures on skin fat versus, goat, uh, versus uh, gut fat in goats. Uh, in these animals, most of the fat is abdominal fat, indicated by the yellow bars here on various degrees of inanition and obesity in goats. Uh, the subcutaneous fat, indicated by the letter Q, is a small percentage of the whole. But in humans, the vast majority of the body fat is subcutaneous. And, these, and the yellow bars down at the bottom, the abdominal stuff, these are tiny. Okay, and there's a similar big difference between humans and many other animals. The human bar being the percentage of, of cutaneous fat on the left there, and then the, all these other animals, guinea pigs and sheep and musk oxen and so on. But now to figure out what, if anything, this difference means, we have to take differences in body size and diet into account because the animals involved in this comparison here are mainly herbivores. Leaf-eating animals have to have big gut, indicated in yellow here on the deer, uh, where the leaves that they eat can sit and ferment uh, 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 because animals can't digest cellulose. A deer is kind of like a four-legged compost heap. Okay, it, it, it can't digest the cellulose in its diet until it's broken down into, into shorter carbohydrates by its gut bacteria. But people are different. We eat foods that are higher in energy and easier to digest, and we pre-digest a lot of our food by cooking and fermenting and so on before we put it in our mouths. So people have smaller guts, as Leslie Aiello has famously demonstrated, and therefore less space for gut fat. 
So you might expect us to have less abdominal fat than animals like deer and goats. A more appropriate comparison for humans might be carnivores like cats and dogs and bears. And here are some data comparing the masses of skin fat, the line above, with gut fat down below in carnivores and humans. And it turns out that there's an, uh, there's an allometric factor here. The bigger a carnivore gets, the, more, the larger the percentage of its total fat that goes into subcutaneous fat. So when we compare the ratio of skin fat to gut fat in humans and other animals, we have to correct for body size. And when we do that, you can see that humans, the red arrow here, have a lot more skin fat and less gut fat than we would expect for carnivores in our size range. You'd expect a carnivore of our size to have about twice as much skin fat as gut fat, the difference between the dotted and solid lines there. Humans have 12 to 13 times as much because this is a log logarithmic scale. Okay, so it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise then that when you take the fur off, carnivores, even human-sized carnivores, also look saggy and wrinkled. They don't have the kind of sleek, shiny skin that we see in our own species. So. Why do we have so much skin fat? It may have something to do with thermoregulation, okay, which Dan Lieberman talked about earlier. We humans cool ourselves by sweating instead of panting the way most mammals do. Maybe we got rid of our fur so that sweat can evaporate from our naked skin when we get overheated. It can evaporate faster, maybe. And if so, then if we need the naked skin for evaporation, maybe we need the fat as a substitute for the fur on those occasions when we need to run the thermoregulation the other way and stay warm. Maybe so. There's a lot to be said for that story. It's in most of the textbooks. But there's two problems with it that annoy me. Okay, uh, the, the first is that there are some animals that cool themselves by sweating and also have insulating fur, like the galloping zebras that D Dan Lieberman showed you earlier, or like this horse. Second, when humans go on a diet, the first pounds that get lost come from the skin fat. Uh, if we need our skin fat to stay warm, you might think we'd hold on to it as long as possible. And there's a chicken and egg problem here, which is really what, what I'm concerned with. Which came first, the fat, the baldness, or the sweating? It would be more convincing if we could figure out a reason not related to thermoregulation why one of these factors could have been put into place earlier and provided a substrate for the evolution of the other two. So what I want to suggest to you today is that our peculiarly fatty skin may be a byproduct of that upright posture that we're so proud of. Okay, the weight of the organs and fat in the abdomen is supported by t in two ways. First, by direct attachment above the red arrows to the inside of the body cavity. And below, by the pressure exerted on the abdominal contents by the contraction of the abdominal muscles surrounding them underneath the skin. Now, in an animal that walks around on all fours, the resulting intra-abdominal pressure produced by the contraction of these supporting muscles is pretty evenly distributed from one end of the abdomen to the other. But in an animal with an erect trunk, that pressure is concentrated at the tail end of the abdomen, down here, for the same reason that the pressure in a carton of juice is concentrated at the bottom, because the, the weight at the bottom that has to be borne is much larger than the weight that has to be borne at the top. So the result is an increased risk, in the case of viscera here, of hernia and prolapse. What do those terms mean? A hernia, uh, prolapse is when an organ that opens to the outside falls out through its own opening. This animal shows a human pelvis sliced down the middle where this has happened to the uterus, which has also dragged part of the bladder and the rectum out with it as it descended in front and in back. This so-called fallen womb isn't an uncommon occurrence. About 11% of all women in this country will suffer some symptoms of uterine prolapse at some point in their lives. Herniation is different. A hernia occurs when there's some structure running through the muscles surrounding the abdominal cavity, and that structure going through it, like the esophagus going through the diaphragm here, produces a weak spot at which a part of the gut bursts through under repeated intra-abdominal pressure from straining or coughing or whatever. In a hiatal hernia like this, the stomach and part of the small intestine wind up getting pulled up as a, as a loop of gut into the inside of the chest cavity. The most familiar sort of hernia, of course, is inguinal hernia. In both sexes, the gonads develop up near the kidneys, at three months there, intrauterine, and then descend into the pelvis. And in females, they stop there in the pelvis, sensibly enough. But in male mammals, they keep going, and they wind up in a skin bag, the scrotum, down between the hind legs, one of, one of the poster child cases for unintelligent design in animal bodies. <laughs> and 
the descent of the male gonads and all of the plumbing connections they drag behind them, the ducts and the vessels and the nerves. These produce a big weakness in the abdominal wall muscles, and that's a prime target for hernias in humans. Not so common in quadrupeds, in fact quite rare, but very common in humans. Uh, the result is an inguinal hernia like this one, okay, where a loop of small intestine has been pulled through the same canal that the testis followed in its descent and wound up as a gut loop down in the scrotum. In humans, 75% of all hernias in the whole species are of this type. In males, it's 97% of all hernias. And about 25% of all men are going to get one, I'm sorry. Uh, they're much rarer in quadrupedal mammals for the obvious reason, the concentration of pressure at the lower end of the upright human trunk. As you can imagine, having a, a loop of gut like that going through that canal and getting stuck down there can be life-threatening. Now, in general, as you might expect, prolapse and hernia are more common in obese people. It makes sense. When you, when you pile fat into the abdominal cavity, intra-abdominal pressure goes up. The, the abdomen inflates with fat. So it's easier for the uterus to get pushed out or for uh, the stomach to herniate up into the chest cavity next to the esophagus. But here's the crucial fact. The more obese a man, comes, a man becomes, the less his chances of getting an inguinal hernia. Okay, very marked reduction with increasing obesity. How come? I suggest that it's because when humans, at least humans of reproductive age, pile on excess fat, they add it disproportionately to the skin. And skin fat pushes inward, not outward, on the body wall. Adding skin fat doesn't help directly with uterine prolapse because there's no skin fat pushing upward on the opening of the vagina. It doesn't help with hiatal hernia because there's no fat pushing downward on the top of the diaphragm. But skin fat resists inguinal hernia, like this. And because skin fat gets added at higher rates than abdominal fat in humans, obese men are in effect providing themselves with a truss that reinforces the body wall. So it makes sense that a uniquely erect mammal should have uniquely fat skin to reduce intra-abdominal pressure and transfer it to the outside of the abdomen's weak points. And this is also true in females. Women also suffer in from inguinal hernia, and like men, they are insulated from it by obesity. Okay, but they have to deal with another really major factor that increases intra-abdominal pressure, namely pregnancy. Given this uniquely female stress on the abdomen, we might expect that female humans would, if anything, have an even higher ratio of skin fat to gut fat than males have to free up abdominal space and keep the abdominal pressure as low as possible during this inflationary f period of pregnancy. And in fact, this is what we find. The human pattern is even more pronounced in women than in men. Women have a significantly greater preponderance of skin fat over gut fat, both in percentages, shown here, and in absolute mass. Here are the female bars comparisons are the two on the left. So to sum up, in most other mammals, about half the body fat is visceral. But in humans, the vast majority is subcutaneous, the red bars. And this makes functional sense as a response to the increased stress on the lower abdomen resulting from upright posture. Now, if all this is correct, then the peculiar features of the human skin must have begun evolving, along with bipedality, back in early Australopithecus. And the distinctive appearance of the human body may predate the advent of an active, open country lifestyle of the kind that Dan Lieberman talked about in animals like these, the earliest members of the genus Homo. An inherited layer of insulating subcutaneous fat may in fact have been one of the things that made that new lifestyle possible. Thanks.